Hey guys, Mr. Klein here, and we've got a pandemic on our hands here. So in case you haven't noticed, the novel coronavirus called SARS-CoV-2 is spreading into nooks and crannies of communities around the world. In fact, at this time of the recording, there's over 500,000 cases worldwide, with us here in Louisiana having one of the highest numbers of cases in the United States per capita, thanks to the outgrowing outbreak in New Orleans and in other places in the state. So now if you're like me, you're sitting at home with nothing to do but get lost down YouTube holes and wondering what people will do with all of the toilet paper they're hoarding. Now there's a lot of discussion in academic papers, online, on forums, YouTube videos, all about the exponential rise of infections over time, as well as how the growth of the infections might happen too quickly for our capacity to treat them in hospitals, leaving doctors with decisions over who gets treatment and who doesn't. We're not going to talk about this part of the pandemic outbreak. Rather, what we're going to talk about is what happens when we get to the other side of the growth. What happens to a pandemic as it declines and the pandemic itself finally comes to an end? The reason for this comes down to natural selection. Traits that help an organism survive and thrive in their environment keep on getting passed on as they reproduce. If traits appear that reduce their chance of survival, or the environment becomes less conducive to reproduction, the organism's population declines. Based on the number of infections and the exponential growth curve worldwide, it's obvious that this virus has an environment that makes it easy to reproduce. However, these conditions will not last forever and the population will start to fall, mainly due to a more hostile environment for reproduction, by the way. Think of it like this. So in an outbreak, there's three kinds of people. There's people who are sick currently, the people who were sick but have recovered, as well as, finally, the people who haven't been sick yet. As a pandemic develops, the rate which people get sick dramatically increases, causing the number of people who haven't been sick yet to fall. As all of this is going on, the number of people who recover will ignore the people who die just to make things easier for this explanation, slowly increases. Now after a certain point, it starts becoming more difficult for the virus to infect new people, because not only are there fewer people who can be infected, but also the progress of the virus is blocked by people who can't carry the virus because they're immune to it. Add to this measures like quarantine and social distancing and the availability of susceptible people drops even further. This change leaves the virus in a situation where it's not well adapted to its surroundings. Without new victims to infect, the pandemic grinds to a halt. The situation where the immune protects those vulnerable to infection is what we call herd immunity. Given enough time, vaccines can be developed and given to those who've not been infected to keep them healthy. Herd immunity forms the basis of vaccine usage to not just protect those who get the vaccine, but also protect those who for some medical reason can't get a vaccine themselves. So by the way, don't be an idiot. Get your vaccines. At this stage, we don't know the percentage of people People immune in a population to create herd immunity for COVID-19, the disease caused by this virus. But rough estimates indicate you need anywhere from 28% to nearly 80% immune in order to achieve it. Needless to say, the only way we can get there is either to develop vaccines over time or everyone who can just start licking some doorknobs and breathing deeply in hospital ERs. So in case you're wondering why we can't just do that and let everyone get infected and get it over with, what would happen is the immense number of people people who would require medical attention in that scenario would completely wipe out our ability to treat them. And this would end up causing way more deaths than the alternative of lockdowns and quarantines we have currently worldwide. Now it's not just the environment that causes pandemics to eventually grind to a halt. Hey there, if you're enjoying the video, make sure you click on the like button down there, as well as if you want more content like this, click on the subscribe button, as well as the bell icon to get more notifications when my videos come out, usually about once a month, science, engineering, history, you know, stuff like that. Also, if any of your friends or anybody in your social networks are interested in it, make sure you share the video as well. Okay, enough advertising about this video. Uh, let's get back to what I was talking about, pandemics. Also, genetics plays a role. So every time a virus reproduces, its genetic code is copied. And each time it's copied, there's a chance of a mistake occurring, 
causing a mutation. Now mutations may sound scarier to kind of things that can give you superpowers, but the thing is the vast majority of mutations in all organisms are completely neutral. In other words, they don't do anything for the organism's overall chances of survival. However, on occasion some mutations occur that hurt the virus's ability to infect other people. So for instance, a virus that's normally transmitted through air particles could mutate so it makes someone so sick they're bedridden for weeks. Because the person is stuck in bed, the opportunities for the virus to spread are reduced and that strain eventually dies out. This also means that given enough time, pathogens tend to evolve so they can easily spread but when they infect someone, they don't make them so sick that they can't spread it to other people. A great example of this would be the various viruses that cause the common cold. So you might be thinking, uh, well, if the infection rate drops to a low level, then we're totally out the woods and we don't need to worry about this disease anymore. Well, history proves that big, big pandemics like SARS-CoV-2 have a habit of dropping in to say hello when you least expect it. For instance, after wiping out a significant percentage of Europe's population, in the late 1340s, the bubonic plague would pop up in Europe from time to time, like the Great Plague of London in 1665 to 1666. Well, that killed about a quarter of the city's population in only 18 months. So a more modern example of flare-ups would be the outbreaks of Ebola that occur in Africa on occasion in different parts of the continent, and some of them are actually occurring now. The virus will appear, it'll spread rapidly, and a combination of quarantines as well as the virus's really high mortality rate, and also it's difficult of transmission cause it to subside. The other outcome of a pandemic is that the virus doesn't go away, but instead it becomes part of our lives like the common cold or influenza. So what this means is that the disease becomes endemic or common worldwide. Now some endemic diseases are present year round, while some can be seasonal. What that means is that in some times of the year they're more prevalent in one part of the world than in another one. So for instance, the common cold is a really good example of this. So in the winter of the Northern Hemisphere, viruses responsible for the common cold increase in prevalence there due to better conditions for transmission. While at the same time in the Southern Hemisphere, well, they'll see fewer cases, skip ahead in a few months, and the conditions are reversed. The same actually goes for influenza as well. So if COVID-19 became endemic, its relative ease of transmission, as well as its high mortality rate compared to influenza would make it a recurring public threat to health, much like how influenza kills tens of thousands of people annually. Now, if there's any silver lining to this, it would be that the SARS-CoV-2 virus that causes the disease actually has a really low rate of mutation, meaning that any vaccines created might be affected over a longer period of time than, for instance, influenza vaccines, which require a new batch to be created every year. So there you go. It may take a while, but eventually this pandemic, like all other ones, will wind down and be relegated to the history books. And what will happen is we'll be left to deal with its aftermath just like all the ones before. Just remember, like all other living things, pathogens like viruses deal with pressures related to natural selection and influence their survival. By isolating the populations that are infected, we cause them to naturally die out because of a lack of new hosts. And even given time, herd immunity can start to take hold, limiting the spread of the disease across entire populations. Also, random mutations in pathogens can also reduce their ability to reproduce, reducing infections as well. Now, once infections get to a low enough level, SARS-CoV V2 will transition to either something that flares up from time to time like Ebola or be a seasonal risk to people like the flu or maybe something we even deal with as a nuisance just like the common cold. So this has been an episode of Phenomenon Explained, a series of short videos that explain scientific phenomenon that is aligned to the Louisiana student standards for science, as well as the next generation science standards. This video aligns to MS-LS4-6, which explains how natural selection leads to increases and decreases in specific traits of populations of species over time. So if you have any questions, make sure you put them down in the comments below and thanks for watching.